Rolling sound, rolling cameras. Okay, you ready? We're gonna wing this one. <coughs> Definitely ready. <laughs> Welcome to the mental health and well-being video series that we are doing. My name is Theron, this is Mark, and we are coming to you from the Migro offices in this Mental Health Awareness Month. So today we are going to be looking at the EQ skill of interpersonal relationships. In the last episode we looked at self-expression and how that comes out of and flows out of the way we see ourselves, which is self-perception. Today we're going to be looking at the interpersonal arena. It has a bunch of different sub categories or sub competencies. Mark, tell us what is this slice of the pie all mm. about? Well, I mean, this has got to do with the ability to uh, build relationships that are based on mutual trust and compassion. And I think what uh, really is profound about it is that there's a few different uh, nuances of it, things like empathy, things like social responsibility, the ability to just see that there's a world around you other than yourself. Um, and then, of course, you know, interpersonal relationships, where it really is that ability to create depth-filled uh, relationships, mutual relationships. So a very powerful and important part of EQ. Now, I would say this is probably one of the parts of our own experience of the last year and a half that has really been impacted hugely by yeah, COVID. Um, and, and, of course, by the, the mental health dynamics that have come along with COVID. So really excited to dive into this today and to unpack and explore some of the stats and some of the stuff that's going on in the world today around how our own sense of well-being and our own relationships have been impacted and how those two are, are quite connected in the world today. Okay, this quote, um, very, very famous, very popular, this idea of Ubuntu, which is essentially what we're seeing here. I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. This idea that we are so intricately connected with, with the other people in our lives, that our identity is actually connected and this is a this is a positive thing and it, it also has a dark side and we're gonna unpack and explore a little bit of that as we go let's do a recap on these current stats mark do you remember these two stats I used the same image for both of them in the previous I think it was a couple of episodes back uh, specifically that one on the left there I, you may remember I mentioned thinking it was a typo instead of 48 I was like surely it's 84% yeah. of parents have experienced an increase in stress that was in a, in a study in the US and then this one in South Africa, that 20% of parents, couples, should I say, uh, self-reported that their quarreling had increased. I think 20% is pretty good, if you yeah. ask me. Um, <laughs> if I'm going to be vulnerable here, I definitely. <laughs> definitely. On the top side of that bell curve. <laughs> <laughs> For me, in the, last, uh, in the last year and a half, let, let me just own it. I think my quarreling with my wife has increased. So I'm in that 20%. You know, we're making light of it a little bit, I think, because, uh, you know... Because you can actually, only laugh about we, this. We have to. <laughs> I, I think we have to. But there's a, a reality just in terms of the, the actual destructiveness of this on, on, on families. And if you just have a look at the divorce rate, I yeah. think we were going to share some stats with that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go for it, Theron. So, so there's definitely been a global rise in divorce around the world. It's actually been a bit trickier than I thought it would be to actually nail down some statistics. Oh. I'm not entirely sure why I can't find studies out there, but we all know this anecdotally. And, and I did come across a, a BBC article. They've got a pretty good name. I'm pretty sure that they've done their, their homework. They were saying that according to their research with this British law firm called Stewart's, apparently, that they had logged a 122% increase. Oh. So that's more than double the number of divorces, specifically between July and October last year, which was, I think, I don't live in England, but I think that, that coincides with the sort of high points of their, mm -hmm. of their lockdown and, and the stress there. Like, can you just imagine that? Double, more than double the divorces that are going through yeah. um, as a result of that. A US law firm reported a 34% increase, much lower, but a 34% increase in, in the sale of their basic, just their basic stock standard, no bells and whistles divorce contract that they sell wow. um and and 20 percent of that 34 percent were newlyweds so yeah. they, they didn't have the you know the the long bolstering that long ballast of many many years to to help them weather that so yeah very interesting and then this is also pretty high in wuhan i remember hearing about this very soon in the in the COVID season in fact we we went into lockdown i think not long after they came out of lockdown in, in china and they reported a 100% increase in divorce rates after that first lockdown. Wow. So, so we've got this idea of Ubuntu that I am 
because you are, because we are, I am, and I, my identity is connected. And as I say, that's a positive thing and a negative thing. I mean, the, the rise in these divorce rates is, is indicative of the fact that relationships can really hurt and harm you know, us. What, what strikes me, if I think of your context and, and mine, I think we would both be classified under the really healthy and functional family environment for you and I at home. And yet, if I know what each of us have shared in previous episodes, it's been really hard. And uh, that's in fairly functional families. How much more where things were already tough and, uh, you know, the pandemic or lockdown has just exacerbated things, working from home, kids from uh, doing schooling from home. Yeah. Uh, it really has been a mess. And I think these are just symptomatic of that. Yeah, and, and it's, not just in, uh, it's not just in our personal lives. It's not just in our homes that relationships have taken strain. Uh, in the workplace as well. But, but what's been really interesting in the workplace is that, and I'm going to go to this next study here. I found, I found this out when I was doing some research for this episode. And this fascinates me, and I'll talk through this in a second. But, but this is the flip side of the coin. With, this study was done over 17 different industries with how many people? Shucks, it was, it was 1,271 participants who, who were part of the study. That the impact of the disruption of work, in other words, not being with your colleagues, had a negative impact. So we're seeing both sides, this, you know, both sides of the coin, the positive and the negative of this Ubuntu idea that you know, our relationships really can fall apart, but also when, our, when those relationships that we are used to and accustomed to, especially in the workplace, when they're removed or when we, we go into some remote kind of idea or, or work from home or even hybrid, that the disruption on those relationships is having an impact on workplace well-being. So as you can see here, people reported that they felt 50% 56% decrease in their feeling of control, their sense of agency to be able to control the situation. Um, that loneliness had increased by 45% wow. as a result specifically of not working with your colleagues every day. That, that, was, the, that was the slant of the study. 60% uh, deterioration or 60% worse social relationships and a 35% increase in depression. Again, all of this in the workplace. Now, the people who did this at the Harvard study, an institute called the, the SHINE program out of the, the T.H. Chan School of Public Health, they, they said that the way they framed this was that in, in a season like this, or in, in not a season, but in, in society at the moment, where we're not as involved in clubs and we're not as doing as much volunteer work and that kind of thing, and perhaps fewer people are part of church communities or whatever, whatever those like sort of societal structures are where you have relationship. Because those things are no longer, not because of COVID, just because of where we're at in the 21st century, those things are they're, they're less uh, common than they used to be. And as a result, work is actually filling some of that wow. place. So, so when, when our work relationships have been taken away, it really has an impact on us like this. I, I mean, we've seen this at uh, my group, you know, in, in our small team, um, just the number of chances we've given people to say how do you want to set up your work environment do you want to work remotely do you want to work in the office do you want to blend and again and again in the surveys we've done with our staff there's been a call to actually come back to a physical office so that people can actually physically be together mm. and that's maybe just you know in our small context mm. a symptom of what you're saying here and, and you know to be fair in the context of, of migra we have healthy relationships we have what yeah. what the team <laughs> recognizes and calls a healthy culture. So there's, there's been a call to come back to that. Obviously, it's not like that everywhere. And there's this competing narrative, of course. So many people are saying, no, they're loving working from home. They're loving that flexibility. So, so we don't want to be too binary about the saying one is better than the other, but, but these are definitely trends that are coming out. One other comment from this, from this lady, McNeely, who was in charge of the study, she says, work has become such a predominant influence in our lives. We tend to think of healthcare and we think of public health but work is an intervention in and of itself. These were her words. Wow. So, so it's fascinating to see how when that gets rocked, while we may feel like, yes, we want to work from home, we love the flexibility, it is actually having an impact on our mental health, as we can see from these stats. You, you've just primed a thought for me that we have these kind of fundamental needs, you know, yeah. and one of the needs is, is being massively fulfilled through work, the, the need for community, for relationships, for being a part of something. Mm. Um, and, and now that that's been shaken up and people have been left essentially stranded, literally physically stranded if they're working remotely, that calls into question, is that need being fulfilled? I see you've got Maslow up here. Yeah, yeah. talk to us about this this middle rung here, belongingness and love. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy, one of the old motivation theories that essentially is this hierarchy of needs, um, starting from certain basic needs at the bottom, physiological needs, safety needs, etc. And as each one of those needs are uh, fulfilled, one then uh, uh, gets motivated by the next level of, of needs. And I think what's important for us, maybe in the current moment, Theron, is you know, COVID started off initially as kind of physiological needs. How, how am I going to feed my family or have toilet paper? <laughs> Literally, people yeah. were like stockpiling yeah. because, you know, uh, grocery stores were going to get shut down. Then it was safety needs. How am I going to avoid the virus? So now I need to stay indoors, you know. Now that we've, I think, started answering some of those questions, we know that our physiological needs are going to be okay. Mm. We know with vaccinations happening, some of our safety needs are, are certainly going to be okay. Not for everybody, obviously. Um, but, you know, we're just talking about on the whole. Now what becomes quite prominent or the next layer are the psychological needs. These become, uh, well, these come to the forefront of what is motivating and driving people. And you can see that the, the first kind of layer of that is obviously the belongingness mm. and, and love mm. needs there. And, and what's interesting there again is that it's both sides of the spectrum, uh, positive and negative. Yeah. If, if those core relationships, maybe our, our marital relationships, are falling apart to the point that, that our divorce rate is increasing like it is, that essentially means that need isn't being met. On the other hand, if those healthy, positive relationships are just have not been able to move into, a, 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 you know, pivot into a way that they can still deliver the same value over the last 18 months when we've had, haven't been able to travel. I mean, so many, I've got friends who, whose parents haven't yet met their grandchildren because they live in, in different countries and, and their, you know, their, their children are old enough now that someone would have flown out here or they would have flown there, but they haven't been able to make that happen. So, and, and then of course, as we were talking about work, you know, when those relationships are disrupted, there's an impact. There's this, this great line that we often use in Migro that as food is for the body, so relationships are for the psyche. And we see it in that, in, yeah. in Maslow's graph there, yeah. that it's a vital need. But just like food can poison us, just like we can get food poisoning or we can eat something toxic, relationships can be like that for us as well. So let's, let's dive into some more stats and some more understanding of, of how relationships really are connected to our mental health. Talk to me about this emotional hygiene this this this, this guy guy winch he, he he does a lot of work around hygiene he talks specifically about loneliness yeah i mean i think what i love about um what guy winch went on about he's got that fantastic ted talk mm. um, you know you can go watch just find guy winch um and what what he talks about is how uh, you know loneliness uh, uh, is something that really uh, can be a little bit like smoking that over time it leads to really detrimental health uh, ramifications and uh, because they are, are kind of mental or, or emotional, if you like, they're happening inside of us, we don't, you, don't, you don't experience it when you're walking up a flight of stairs. You know, you're short of breath, so you go, oh, well, it must be impacting on me, the smoking. We, we just tend to cope. You know, mm. we tend to try and have these different coping mechanisms to, to solve it. Or we, so, or we tell ourselves we shouldn't feel that way. Stop it, feeling like that. A, a kind of a self-flagellation for feeling, why should I be lonely? Everyone's going through this, etc. And I think what, what I loved about his concept of emotional hygiene is that if, if we come across certain physiological struggles, we typically would do something hygienic to solve it. Yeah, like first aid, we'd exactly. put a plaster on. Or, exactly. Yeah. And when it comes to these things, these subtle emotional, psychological things that, that lead to a kind of uh, downhill journey of mental health, uh, we, we tend to be very sluggish in treating them like physiological mm -hmm. problems. So if you fall over and graze your knee, you're going to clean it out, you're going to put some disinfectant on, you're going to put a plaster on it to cover it up. Mm. But when something happens, like we, we get struck into the scenario of remote work and not having colleagues and not having family, we don't see it as grazing our psychosocial knee mm -hmm. and deal with it in that way. We, we just kind of carry on, I don't know, watching Netflix or, or trying yeah. to just numb the pain. You push it away, exactly. deny it. He has this great line. He says that loneliness is more harmful. It's more detrimental to your health than smoking. Wow. But it doesn't come in packs and doesn't come with a warning on the label. <laughs> wow. Great line. Yeah, um, yeah he, he says that essentially what loneliness can do is increase your chance of an early death by 14%. Yeah. Makes you more at risk of uh, Alzheimer's. It has an impact on your immune system. So it's a pretty big deal. I would, I would just expand loneliness in, in the current kind of mental health conversation to, you know, a dampened mood, 
maybe it's not loneliness, maybe it's just, you know, I don't know why I'm struggling so much with, maybe it's exhaustion mm. uh, from looking at a screen all day. Maybe it's this kind of stacked mm, trauma mm, mm, mm. of just being afraid all the time of the next person you know that's gonna mm. end up in hospital with COVID. Uh, so whatever it is, you know, maybe it's not that these things, uh, you know, have a bigger physiological impact than, <clears throat> than smoking, um, but it, it's really that we need to have some kind of emotional hygiene mm. in the same way that we would if we'd ha experienced a physical trauma. And what, what better time for that than, than Mental Health Awareness Month where we're trying Sorry. to shine a spotlight on the, on the conversation. I've got three studies here. I'd love you to just whip through them super quickly, Mark. You're familiar with all of this stuff. The refugee study, we're going to talk about the, the winter over syndrome, and then we're going to talk about uh, solitary confinement. Yeah, just fascinating about this uh, study. Obviously, they wanted to just get a sense of the kind of social isolation that refugees face going into a new country, your, your whole social system uh, is not available to you. Um, and you can see this was in 2002, so connectivity was very different in those days to what it is today. And I mean, a 54% increase in, in clinical anxiety um, and a 42% uh, increase in clinical depression. This is, this is a significant increase in depression and anxiety levels when one is socially mm -hmm. isolated. I think if I remember correctly, the stats for, for the, the normal baseline is 10%. Roughly 10% of society will struggle with these things. But if you take someone yeah. out of their context, put them somewhere new without support, the idea is it's without support. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then this is what this is what they saw as an increase. Just a quick note, because I know this might contradict some of the other stats we've shared, is that, that this was 10% at that time in the study in 2002. Yes, yes, so yes. that's quite important. Which is obviously increased. Uh, yeah, but to see just that variance from a 10% mm -hmm. in the population to a 54% and 42% for yeah. anxiety and depression, that's that's radical. Now, I think for me, the, the point of this is not, we're not speaking specifically to refugees. We're saying, let's use this as an example to show us what happens when we are pulled out of our normal relational support structures. Let's, let's jump onto this winter over syndrome. Yeah, I, I remember mean, talking about this right at yeah. the beginning of COVID saying, guys, yeah. if this study is correct, we need to pay attention to these findings. Yeah. So, so remind us. Yeah, I mean, this, was, this is just fascinating for me. It's just so anecdotal in terms of how the environmental changes can radically affect one's emotional state. And I mean, the winter over syndrome is, is quite well known now. Uh, they, they've done research on it with teams that literally get locked in for the winter, winter over syndrome, where um, you know, teams in the Antarctica or in the North Pole or some mm -hmm. pole or, or wherever, um, maybe even in um, you know, some of the, the space stations, I'm sure a similar yeah. thing would, would occur. Um, but there, there seems to be this progressively uh, worsening depression uh, aggressive behavior, these are just some of the symptoms, insomnia, impaired cognitive functioning, and paranoia. And even as I mentioned some of these, I hear these words coming out of yeah. people that we're talking to at the moment. Yeah, it's not just being locked in a bunker that's done that. COVID has done that too. Totally. Okay, jump on to solitary confinement. This is, this is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, uh, Dr. Stuart Gracian that was um, doing this research, obviously had, he had an interest in solitary confinement and just the, the damaging impact uh, after even a very small amount of time of solitary confinement, it literally is torturous. I think that's why it often gets used um, uh, in, a, in a kind of torture environment. Um, but uh, people struggling with panic attacks, uh, you know, showing some symptoms of neurological insanity, um, concentration problems, uh, adverse effects on memory. And th this was from even just short periods in uh, uh, mm -hmm. solitary confinement. And, and that, we, we might think of solitary confinement as like prison you know, or torture, some torture thing in Russia, or I don't know, in the movie or whatever. But just think of someone losing Wi-Fi access, and they stay in a block of flats where, you know, for whatever reason, they don't have any relationships around them, and suddenly you've got solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. so, and and, and the, the thing is, it's the solitary yeah. that is the issue. Yeah. It's yeah, not totally. the cell yeah. or even the food you're eating in prison. It's, it's being solitary, being deprived of human relationships. Yeah. Now... For me, what's fascinating about this is that, that many people failed to actually reintegrate back into society wow. after the fact. Yeah, that was a huge finding that he and, had. And, and what's fascinating is I feel like collectively, we don't know how to go back to the way things were. We don't know how to actually interact. Even to just, I mean, here in South Africa, our, our levels are pretty low right now. Uh, you know, we're not under strict lockdown. But even so, the social interaction outside of work it's just like hard work to actually organize something to see people. You, you've, you've just reminded me how awkward it has become in the social circles I'm in, even just to greet people. 
you can't shake hands anymore so what do you do is it the elbow is it the foot is it it's become like the joke you know can you yeah. go in for the hug is it the side hug is it the hug looking away and if you do like go in for one of those things then you end up having to make a thing of it yeah you know you gotta like sort of like normalize it by saying something so to your point i mean never mind integrating after solitary confinement just going through the solitary confinement of lockdown just integrating back into how to greet one's peers and friends is, is exhausting. Yeah. How much more some of the other uh, greater parts or, or more complex aspects yeah. of social interaction? So if that's the case, if we're coming out of the season, having sort of forgotten a few of our tools, forgotten some skills, perhaps struggling to reintegrate, bringing all this baggage, we some of us may have you know a broken relationship that's happened as we've come out of this, or else we just have missed the life-giving uh, fruit and benefit of, of people close to us that we love. It has an impact on who we are and how we engage. Now, I just want to very quickly run us through this drama triangle concept by Stephen Cartman. For me, this is fascinating. It comes out of literature, actually, and, and, and story around how do you drive story forward? How do you create drama? And he has three characters, or not characters, three sort of character types in, in his matrix. The persecutor, the rescuer, and the victim. And drama is created when a persecutor is persecuting a victim and a rescuer steps in to rescue, to solve, to take them under their wing. But the drama continues when those roles are shifted. For me, this is one of the most insightful models to help me understand human interaction. I want to just give you an example out of Little Red Riding Hood. He actually, he actually uses this example to, to make his point. You've got your different characters. You've got the woodsman, you've got Little Red Riding Hood, you've got the wolf, and you've got grandma. So essentially what happens is the, the, the first victim in the story is grandmother. She's stuck at home. Little Red Riding Hood is the first rescuer. She's going to go visit her grand. She's going to take some nice cookies. She's going to go visit her old granny who's lonely. First rescuer, first victim. On the way, she meets the wolf. She doesn't know it yet, but the wolf is the first persecutor. He's going to go and eat the gran. Of course, the, the, the Little Red Riding Hood doesn't know it yet, but the wolf takes a shortcut, gets to granny's house before Little Red Riding Hood does, and gobbles her up, making gran the first victim. Then the second victim emerges in the form of Little Red Riding Hood herself. She's there, and the same first persecutor is still in the picture and wants to eat Little Red, Little Red Riding Hood as well. But then what happens? Enter the second rescuer in the story, the woodsman. The woodsman comes just in the nick of time and sees what's happening. And as soon as the woodsman arrives in the form of rescuer, there's a new victim. Who's the victim? The wolf. The wolf becomes the second victim, the third victim, should I say, in the story. And in that same moment, the rescuer, the second rescuer, the woodsman, becomes, as an act of rescuing, becomes the second persecutor in the story. And Cartman's point is that when these kinds of interactions happen between these kinds of characters, the drama drives forward. And, and you'll see this in Netflix shows, you'll see this all over the place. The way they move the drama forward is by having different characters cycle in and out of the victim mode. Now, for me, this is a fascinating structure. And, and the impact that this has at work, especially when our normal systems of work are perhaps out the window, and when all of these pressures that we've talked about are, are coming home to roost. What, is, what does this look like for teams? Well, I mean, just on the back of what we were sharing with some of the symptoms that, that we've seen in you know, winter over syndrome or refugees or whatever, there's two that stand out for me that plot perfectly onto the drama triangle. The one is a, a rise in, in aggression, and that would speak to a persecutor. You, know, you might have people that are now interacting um, in whatever way with their colleagues, um, taking on the, the persecutor role um, just through the kind of aggression that might uh, be symptomatic for them of some of their experience in lockdown. The second was the rise in kind of depressive symptoms or depression, which I think would uh, speak to kind of an emotional inclination of, of the victim role mm. um, and taking on perhaps a victim mindset. And, and I think this is a very normal response for many people. You know, COVID has happened to us. The lockdown has happened to us. We have we been the victims. No, we didn't choose it. Yeah, we have been the victims of this persecutor um, of COVID. And so what you might start seeing in certain teams is quite, quite nicely moving into a codependent relationship of persecutor and victim um, in, in certain teams. And then, of course, those that want to run around and play the rescuer. And we've even seen that in, in our, I think, fairly functional work environment where certain people, uh, after any Zoom call, will be phoning all of the others frantically to just check in. Are you OK? Are you OK? That's the rescuer. Because, because as soon as you add a digital layer 
onto this whole idea of work. Yeah. As we know from social media, it's, it's harder to be human, actually, in a digital context, in a remote context. It's easier to be passive aggressive. It's easier to, to not invest. Everything has become harder. Communication has become harder during this time. Leadership has become harder. And if, if, we, if we don't lean heavily in to trying to move forward in some kind of healthy way, then we're just gonna see this downward spiral yeah. like we've looked at. Yeah. So, so what can we do? What can we do about this at work? One of the great things I think about the drama triangle is just um, you know some of the writing that's been done around the empowerment dynamic. And I, I think you've done a little bit more thinking and writing around this there, and so I'd love to hand over to you. Okay. But essentially that it's possible to take on slightly different roles by just asking slightly different questions um, and, and imputing into one's thinking and one's behaving uh, a different way of being. Mm -hmm. um, and it of course leads to this uh, empowerment dynamic uh, you know, these roles that are equivalent but opposite of, of creator, challenger and coach. And in fact, you can see here that the drama triangle has been flipped. It's yeah. been flipped on its head and the, and the roles, the characters have been recast into new roles. One of the things that, that's so great about this model of the drama triangle is that as soon as I act at you as a persecutor, you take that as an invitation to be a victim. Yeah. That's the way it works. We, we persuade each other into certain ways of responding. Now, what the empowerment dynamic is trying to get us to do is to say, no, I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to accept that I your, must Your be, offer to yeah, come into the drama. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to try and play a different role. I'm going to, instead of be a victim, I'm going to be a creator. Instead of being a persecutor, I'm going to be a challenger. I'll challenge you. I'll, you know, I'll speak to you in, in ways that can, that can take you somewhere, but I'm not going to cut you down and kill you. Now, and then the same is true, the coach instead of the rescuer. Now, one of the ways that we can do this in our teams is by actively leaning in to affirmation of each other. In fact, the giveaway of this, um, this series today is this giving praise technique. So you'll find it there on the landing page and, and yeah, you, you, you can give that a go in your workplace. If you're a leader, it's even more important for you. Um, yeah, and, and realize again your own sense of agency. If leaders can do that, I think it's gonna make a, a huge impact on on what it means to be working remotely or in a hybrid context or situation. There is power that we have in the workplace, in our context, and if we lean into that, we can move forward. Any final words from you, Mark, before we oh, I think something off? like this, uh, this giveaway, this giving praise technique, I think for, for us each to start leaning into something like that allows us to in, infuse uh, some positivity and some positive thinking into the relationships around us. Um, rather than, I, I think, being a victim to uh, uh, or persecutor of uh, just some of the very negative mm, and struggling yeah. dynamics that are there. And I think this could create, just kicking back to one of our previous sessions, a little bit more of an upward spiral relationally. As we uh, build that ratio, that positivity exactly, ratio. Yeah. In, in, in the teams that we're working mm, with, and mm, it can mm. be really powerful. Great. Well, I think we're pretty much done for the day. Should we say goodbye, wish Let's them luck, and see them next time? <laughs> Let's do it. Thanks so much for joining us in this session, and we'll see you in the next episode. Okay.